Say what's cracking YouTube? It's your boy 16 to life and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Y'all down. Now for those of y'all that's new to my page, in 1994 I got arrested. I was eventually sentenced to 16 years plus life and I served 24 years straight in the California prison system. During those times I accumulated some good stories. I'm going to share one with y'all today. If you happen to like this video, definitely be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification bell. That way anytime I drop a story, you will be notified ASAP and you can hop on it whenever you're ready. Now let's hop right up into this story. So... A couple of days ago, I had put up an interview that I'd done with my homie Chances. During the course of that interview, he spoke a little Swahili. So I got quite a few comments in the comment section asking me about the inception of Swahili being spoke in the California Department of Corrections by black prisoners. So I'm going to give you a little video on that. So we have, there was a brother, right? You hear people refer to him as Comrade George or possibly George Jackson. Now, George Jackson in 1961 was arrested for a $70 gas station robbery uh, while riding in the car um, with an acquaintance. Now, while it is well known or at least well alleged or, or, or the information is out there that the acquaintance is the one who committed the robbery, George Jackson pled guilty believing uh, the advice of his lawyer that he would only be sentenced to a few months county jail time. He was eventually sentenced to life <coughs> for a $70 gas station robbery. Upon doing his time, due to a lot of extreme unfair treatment uh, by racist guards, you had a lot of black prisoners being shot and killed. Um, he became a black revolutionary. Um, during this time, he at some point felt it was extremely important for black prisoners, whether they was in the hole whether it was on the main line or the San Quentin Adjustment Center, to learn how to communicate in a, in a language when they was around people, they considered their enemies or their oppressors, that language couldn't be understood. So he implemented the use of Kiswahili or Swahili. Now what Swahili is, is it is the official language of the African Union. It is the official language of Tanzania and Kenya. And it's a language used in Africa by over 200 million people. Now the word Swahili basically means of relating or of the coast. And that word was a, um, that word was a language that was spoke on the East Coast. The Swahili was originally a language spoke by the Bantu African people and the people on the East Coast, regardless of what walk of life they was from, you had people, you had um, French traders, you had Hindu traders, Chinese traders come to the East Coast to trade goods and speak languages people of different political aspirations, they would come there and they eventually started to speak this language, this same language, so everybody could um, com communicate with each other. And so this language increasingly grew. And now, like I said, it is the most widely spoke language in Africa. And so George Jackson, once again, feeling that it was important that blacks in prison be able to talk um, over the heads of others came up with this idea. Now, a lot of people may not realize that back in those days, you had some extremely violent, vicious, long-lasting wars between different races. And you had you had other other races, you had other races who spoke different languages, whether it was Spanish. Sometimes it was said that the whites back then either spoke, spoke Jordan or Nordic. So it was important to be able to speak in a, in a language sometimes when you didn't have the luxury of speaking in privacy or being able to speak to a person in close proximity where just him and you could understand or hear what was being said. So that was extremely, that was extremely important, right? So um, once again, as we talk about, um, you know, prison history where it's not always documented. You're going to have people who have different beliefs, people who have heard different things. And so what if, if I'm saying something that's different from what you heard or what you believe, my apologies in advance. By me knowing this, I spoke to many individuals who had started doing time back then, uh, especially a good friend of mine known as Big Marcellus. Big Marcellus is from Compton. He done 32 years. And I believe he said he originally went to prison in 1996. Uh, he served some time and eventually came back in 1984 where he unfortunately was sentenced to life and did 32 years. So I asked him, um, when did he notice 
the decrease of Swahili being spoke by black prisoners. Because once again, let's keep in mind, um, black Swahili was being spoke by. You had Crips. You had Bloods from down south. You had BGF from down south. You had BGF from from uh, Northern California as well. Oakland, the Bay, Bay Area as well. So all these individuals, not every last one of them, but all these individuals from different walks of life, from different sections, from different cadres, some of them spoke Swahili, right? And he said that he noticed a change. And one of the things he felt that played a part in the decrease of, of Swahili being spoke by the black population is what when some of the bigger black groups back then started to beef and have have difference of opinions with each other. Whether if it whether it was the BGFs, the CCOs, the Vanguards, the Blue Notes, whatever. He believed that's one of the things that led to the deterioration of the speaking of Swahili. Another thing that he mentioned is a lot of times when after the Crips and Bloods was just forming and coming to prison, some of their older homies would push up on them with the attitude of, you going to learn this or else. And the way that they were approached made those younger generation individuals rebel from, from understanding why it was important. You know, he said that now looking back on the situation, he felt that they should have approached them better and under and explained why it was important for them to learn certain things as opposed to they better learn it, right? Um, I got to prison in 1996 and by that time, um, I definitely believe the long lasting four or five six years sometimes wars of killings and stabbings that 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 was suffered and experienced by george jackson uh individuals in marcellus's time who came to prison had not continued uh, uh when i got to prison in 1996 right um and that played a big part of it too the deterioration of of learning the language and things of that nature. So when I got to prison in 1996, I had a celly by the name of Big H who also happened to be from Compton. Now, he you may hear people refer to him as Big H or Big Heron. Now, a lot of times when I say Heron, people will confuse him with the Heron who was affiliated with Suge Knight and Death Row. But no, it is not that Heron. The Heron that I'm talking about was from Compton. He was from the Grandies. He was a Crip. And in 1996, he had already been incarcerated, maybe 15, 16 years on a life sentence. So anyway, one day we happened to be on the yard and I hear Big H talk Swahili to another dude, right? So when, when we got back in the cell, I asked him, I said, hey, homie, what was, uh, what was that language you were speaking out there? And he told me that it was Swahili. So I asked him if he could teach it to me, right? So he said, well, you know, it's been so long since I've spoke it on a, on a big scale like that that I, I forgot a lot of it, right? But he did teach me some, right? And during that time as well, you would also hear Swahili being spoke on the tier, but in a much lesser degree. It wasn't spoke in full conversations. You, It was just common words or common phrases being used. And some of those words was, of course, Asante which is thank you. Or you may hear a dude come to the door or a few doors down and be like, hey, brother, let me get some kahawa, which is coffee, you know, indugu, brother. You know, hey, homie, where that kisu at? Which is knife. And so uh, also, kiwe, which is crip. Well, actually, the real term is kiwete, which is cripple. Now, sometimes a Swahili word may not be the exact or have the exact same meaning as an English word. So I guess people back then who was teaching Swahili would find the closest word to it with a similar with a similar meaning, right? Also, we of course we had Damu for for blood. Now, if you would happen to go to the hole back then, uh, you would you would be given what was called a 114D. Now, what a 114D is is a paper that's given to you by the administration which explains why you were being placed in the hole. So now you would slide your 114D, if you was black, to whoever was in charge of the roll call back in, back in the hole. Now, and so what the 114D is, it's a paper explaining uh, why you're being placed in the hole. If that 114D, um, if the 114D says that you are in the hole for something that's not frowned upon, then your name will be placed on the roll call. So then in the morning, uh, <clears throat> around five o'clock in the morning, 
uh, when they will start, you know, uh, acknowledging people, somebody may come, somebody would be at the door of their cell and they would say, chill, in Jema Asubui. I would already be awake at my cell door. I would say, in Jema Asubui, which means good morning. Then they would go to the next person. Hey, man, uh, uh, Rick Rock, in Jema Asubui. Uh, Rick Rock would then reply, in Jema Asubui, so on and so forth, until every black who was on the roll call was acknowledged. Sometimes in some holes I've been in, they would say, uh, in Jema uh, Alasiri, which is good afternoon. But for the most part, it was just good morning and good night, which is in Jema Usiku. Actually, I believe good night is really in Jema uh, in Wema. But sometimes, like I said, um, they would take certain words uh, used in English and get that word and, and just say it in Swahili. When sometimes in Swahili, they may have certain phrases or they may have, Swahili may have four or five, four or five words for one word, depending on what context that you use it, that you use it in. So, um, a lot of, a lot of prisoners in, in, in uh, the California Department of Corrections, they may not necessarily, they may not necessarily didn't speak Swahili in the correct in the correct form, or they didn't use the correct the correct word structure. But for all intents and purposes of being able to talk over somebody's head, it still was being used in that in that context, right? Um, uh, uh, excuse me. So also, Marcellus, one thing that he said that was important too is not only was Swahili being spoke on the main lines or in the shoe or what have you, it was also being used to write kites uh, and send messages to people. Now, a kite is basically just <clears throat> a kite is basically just a note that you're sending to one of your comrades or another one of your homies and you fold it up real small. And so uh, using Swahili was also a safeguard because in the event that kite fell into wrong hands, whether it was administration or even somebody who you didn't want to know with, with what you was talking about and they didn't read Swahili, the kite would not be able to be deciphered. Um, Big Marcellus explained to me as well as I've heard, as well as I've heard many other people who have done prison time say at one point in time, Swahili had became so prevalently used in the part in, in the California Department of Corrections by black prisoners that the administration started ordering Swahili books to teach themselves how to speak Swahili so they could decipher some of these kites and try to understand sometimes what was being said. Um, so I did notice as I started to transfer down to lower levels, especially like a level three, um, when you had more people who around my generation who was coming to prison. And like I said, Swahili wasn't being used as much as it was with the older generations. You would have some individuals not understand its importance and they may frown on it like saying, oh, man, that dude over there talking Swahili. He on that level four stuff. He on that super convict stuff. And my my reasoning is. The reason why some people in my generation may have felt like that because they did not have to experience the wars that maybe Big H or Big Marcellus or Comrade George Jackson went through where uh, you might be warring with another race for four or five years. And every time the cell is open, every 72 hours when they let you guys out, there's stabbings and killings going on. So if you didn't experience that, then the reason... Uh, why Swahili was being spoken, and those type of strategies became less relatable and less important to an individual who didn't experience those type of things. Because like I said, a lot of times on those lower levels, um, you had Crips and Bloods and people from up north who didn't speak Swahili and they didn't understand why it was important that they try to learn it. Um, now, when I was in Ironwood, I would say around 2003, yes, 2003, I happened to go to the hole. Uh, once I was, I went to the hole for a riot. Once I was released to the hole, I was sent to B yard and eventually given a job in the kitchen. Now, when you're working in the kitchen, if you happen to go out the back door to dump the trash or whatever, there's a big old giant fence up like you may, like you may see back there. Then it might be 30 or 40, 30, 40 of yards of road. And then on the other side is the, is the, is the uh, AR kitchen. I was working in the BR kitchen. And so during that time, there was a new guard working back there. He may have been 22, 23, young dude, uh, had only been working two or three months, was, you know, a stickler for the rules, trying to make sure everybody done everything they were supposed to do. And we were not permitted to talk from 
one kitchen fence to the other. So if I'm on B yard, we wasn't permitted to talk to the kitchen workers on A yard if they happen to be outside dumping the trash or, do, or doing whatever. So I'm trying to get moved to A yard. And so I happen to see one of my homies over there, a dude by the name of Thumper from Los Gang out of Moreno Valley. Uh, in the course of me doing these stories, somebody left a comment saying that he passed away. So rest in peace to my boy Thumper. So anyway, me and Thumper happened to be on C yard together. And around that time, I wouldn't say that I was fluent in Swahili, but I spoke it well, extremely well enough to have a conversation with another individual if he spoke it well. You know, and I may have to add in an English word or two here and there, but like I say, I had a, a, a very decent vocabulary. And so I happened to see him, and I'm trying to get moved over there to uh to AR. So I tell him, uh, Ambia Zawayan Wazi Laini Kuhama Mimi Ju Pale Yadi, which is basically tell the homie smooth to move me over to that yard. You know, once again, rest in peace to the homie smooth. Smooth happened to be on that yard at the time. Smooth from the Heights. Turhan, he had a lot of juice and he eventually did end up getting me moved. So now I'm, I said it quick because I'm assuming that this, that, that this white guard is going to come and say, Hey man, uh, no talking through the fence. So then, um, the homie thumper, he hit me with his reply. You know, he told me, yeah, okay, I'll tell him to get you moved over there. Then we sat there and we conversated a little bit more in Swahili because old boy wasn't tripping, right? So maybe about 10 minutes later, as I'm back in the kitchen and I'm working, he comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, Willis, uh, what was that language that you were speaking? I said, oh, man, that was Swahili. He said, oh, you African? I said, yeah, I'm African. You know, he said, no, I'm serious, man. I said, yeah, I'm serious. I'm African. Well, you know what I look like, you know, because uh, in my opinion, black is a color uh, it's not a black is definitely not a it's not a uh, ethnicity, but that's a that's something else. But anyway, he said, well, no, man, were you born in Africa? I said, no, I was born in America. He said, well, how did you learn Swahili? And I said, oh, man, I studied it. Right. And so uh, he like I say, due to the fact that he was a rookie, he had only been working two or three months. He had never heard Swahili being spoke, especially by a black prisoner. Right. And I seemed to get the feeling that he was impressed because you know, by being new, I don't know what they taught him in the academy, but, uh, you know, just thinking that a person could learn another language, especially a black person, was something that obviously impressed him or whatever, right? And so, um, once again, that goes to my point from people from my generation or, or whoever never took the time to learn Swahili. You know, when you're in prison, when you're in a place where from time to time, you know, situations may, um, spontaneously break out or situations may happen where you know your life is ex ex your life is at stake sometimes it's important to be able to talk in another language without having certain people be able to be privy to what you're saying because let's keep in mind you know you have a lot of different ethnicities in prison and um if there's something going on you know People happen to talk over people's heads. Of course, we have the Mexicans who speak Spanish. You know, we have the Samoans who speak Samoa. You may have uh, Koreans in there who speak Korean. Um, I've even heard of, I've never personally heard myself, but I've even heard of some <clears throat> white inmates being able to speak German. Some of them being, being able to speak Nordic, so on and so forth, right? Um, so being able to speak another language sometimes when, when you know, um, what you're saying is not something you want everybody to hear. It's definitely uh, extremely useful, right? So anyway, you already know what it is, man. It's your boy 16 to life. That's just a little something of how Swahili happened to be implemented and started being used in the California Department of Corrections by a lot of black prisoners back in the days. It's your boy 16 to life. Resume normal program.